Hello everybody, it's Friday evening. The sun is setting. The forecast has the skies clear for a few hours, just long enough for Shadow and I to get in some astrophotography therapy. And that's exactly what it is for me, is uh, therapy. You know, uh, there's a lot of stresses in life. We all have them, doesn't matter whether you're uh, a worker, a husband, a father, a mother, a, a, a child, a, a student, life has stresses. And so it's important to have an outlet that, you know, we really enjoy and look forward to uh, and uh, get out and do frequently. So for me, that's going out and doing astrophotography and rock counting and camping and hiking with Shadow. One of the things I love about astrophotography therapy is that it requires my full attention. Setting up the mount, getting all the, you know, the scope attached, polar aligned, star aligned, balanced, getting the computer all connected, the software all working. And as I focus on the task at hand, uh, my brain is too small to think about uh, too many things at one time. So it uh, helps further take things that may be weighing on me uh, off my mind and then just uh, you know the cosmos looking up at the various deep space objects that are out there the nebulae <laughs> the nebulas uh, that's a good word we should talk about that word sometime how do you use the word properly nebula nebulae nebulosity nebulous uh, it's easy to get them all tripped up, but just looking at the various nebulae, these distant galaxies, star clusters, the constellations that have been used for thousands and thousands of years for navigation and tracking of the seasons and the times. So, yeah, we love astrophotography therapy, don't we, Shadow? What are you doing? Don't eat anything. No eating, okay? It gets dark fast up here, so I better hurry up. Okay, we are set up, we're balanced. Now, in just a few minutes, when it gets a little darker, we will uh, polar align and then star align and cross our fingers on these clouds. <laughs> I think we're gonna be okay. <laughs> we're gonna find out. While we're waiting for it to get dark, and you can see, maybe I can see my own breath, it's gonna be probably about 34 degrees Fahrenheit by the time we leave tonight. And uh, I'm not gonna stay out too late, but it gets dark fast and cold fast up in the desert. So to stay warm, I'm gonna try out this little solo stove that it's a little uh, fire pit, little mini uh, fire pit. And I tried it out already in my backyard just to make sure I knew how it worked. And there it is. And you can uh, feed it with just little sticks or pellets but it throws off a lot of heat. And while the rig is doing its thing, I can just huddle over here around the fire and stay warm. It's also right on the ground and it's away from the rig, so the light won't interfere with uh, astrophotography. So that's what I'm gonna be doing while I'm waiting. Uh, I can see the first star. That's a good sign. You can see some stars. Uh, we just gotta wait for the uh, Polaris to be visible, and there's still some clouds. So we got a little ways to go, but it should be a nice night. I uh, polar aligned, star aligned, and decided to land on the Flaming Star Nebula and the surrounding nebulae. Uh, I'll uh, take you over to the rig here in a minute after it's got enough uh, sub-exposures to, um, to have a visible image using Livestack with 
electronically assisted astrophotography where you can actually see the image developing before your very eyes. So we'll go over there in just a minute and take a look at it. But I need to warm up for the time being, so I'm just going to stay right here around the fire for a few minutes and uh, warm up. Okay, we've made ourselves over to the rig. So what I'm going to do now is come over to the histogram, set this, stretch this image out a bit, and I will show you Flaming Star and Nebula. There we go. The image is building right before our very eyes. Okay, we are now at uh, 26 minutes of exposure. And you can see now, this, this part here is the flame, the flame nebula. And the flame nebula is a cloud of interstellar dust. And it's lit by what's called a runaway star. Most stars, when they're born, they fall into a gravitational path that rotates around the center of the Milky Way in a nice consistent pattern. But every now and then you get a runaway star. And a runaway star can be brought about by a supernova or gravitational interaction that has it flying through the galaxy in its own course. And right now there is one that's flying right through the flame nebula. And it's a hot star and it is lighting up the gases and the dust and the hydrogen atoms are excited and are emitting light. Okay, I had to come back over by the fire because it's getting cold out there. So included in Auriga is not only the um, flaming star nebula that's lit up by that um, rogue star that's not following the traditional gravitational pattern around the center of the Milky Way, but is flying through space uh, on its own course. Then in addition to the Flaming Star and the Tadpole Nebula, uh, we have the Spider Nebula, uh, several star clusters, uh, and just a lot of um, dense space dust. Okay, let's see how we're doing here. We've got 45 minutes of data now. Flaming star, tadpole, spider, star cluster. It's a Messier object. I can't remember the number. Another one up here. This is really, Auriga is really dense with stars and nebulas, nebulae, <laughs> uh, nebulosity. Okay, we're doing great. I'm going to go back and stay warm by the fire. Well, we're loaded up and in the truck, it got cold, 38 degrees out there. That little fire made a big difference, but I think little Shadow, I think he's had enough. Huh? you're all cuddled up in that blanket and he's not going anywhere. So it's not too late though, 10.30. We're gonna head home and uh, we'll process this thing in the morning and we'll see how it turned out.